All right, welcome everyone. Um, we are going to start soon. So, um, little housekeeping, please keep your um, audio on mute. And also, if you want to have better internet or if you have any internet problems, you can also switch off the video. Um, but yeah. Okay, so shall we start? One second. Right. So um, thank you everyone for your attendance today. Um, for those that just joined us for the first time, welcome. And for those that have been here since the beginning or since the uh, past two months, uh, welcome back. Um, we are the Nature Hero Talks series um, by the <clears throat> Malaysian Nature Society, the Grace Milan and Malacca branch. If you'd like to be a voice for nature, be sure to join the MNS membership. You can join as a family, as an individual, or as a school in this link below. Once you've joined this MNS, you will be um, a part of a network of 14 branches across Malaysia where you can share your uh, passion and your experience with uh, working with nature and also cultivate your uh, interests. The objective of this talk series, um, this is the third um, Nature Hill talk series uh, entitled Environmental Literacy. So we want to provide a basic understanding of the environment and also cultivate young scientists to be uh, to pursue this um, role and to uh, conserve our environment for the future. So this talk series is held in the ecopartners.online app. And from this app, you can register for talks, get reminders for future talks. You can also win prizes and record your positive environmental impact uh, with eco points. Students can also earn extracurricular activity points through uh, Ministry of Education uh, certification. So the talk today will be for 30 minutes. And um, after that, there will be 10 minutes of uh, time where you can ask our speaker any questions you might have. And for those uh, watching from Facebook uh, page, please key in, your chat or, uh, key in your chat or your questions in the chat box or in the comment section. And we will also ask your question here as well. At the same time of the Q&A, uh, there will be a quiz, so um, the quiz will be in the app and uh, the top five uh, fastest and most accurate um, person to get uh, to submit will win uh, prizes. You can also download your e-certificates uh, on the app with 70% uh, points minimum. If you'd like to be a volunteer, um, please contact us because we will train you and um, so that you can help us in the talk series. So there will be two types of certificates. Um, every, uh, every talk session, which happens every two weeks, you get 70% and above. You will get a certificate issued by MNS, Nervous uh, Land and Malacca branch. And to get the top five, you have to have the fastest yeah. this mark. So uh, don't fret if you haven't been the fastest. Uh, if you get ha higher mark than the fastest before, you can still win the top five. And if you complete the follow-up actions, you will earn 50 eco points, which can be used to exchange for items later. The second type of certificate is recognized by Ministry of Education. And to get that certificate, you need to join our two-hour forum, which will be held on the last day of the talk series, which is on 30th of October, where we will discuss and refresh all the topics that we learned uh, so far, which, and then we will be followed by 50 quiz questions. 80% of these questions will be from talks that's already been covered in the previous uh, talks in this series, and 20% of the questions will be on that day's discussion. And then you will have 24 hours to, to complete the quiz. There will be two types of uh, certificates on that day, 
And if you attend it, you will get the CGO Premier Ta'an or participation certificate. And if you get top five for the quiz, you will get CGO for Tandingan and for Chapayan or competition and achievement certificate. All the talks will be recorded and will be posted on YouTube since the 12th of June. And you can do the watch the videos as many times as you want, do the quiz and follow our actions to get all your points. So the certificate now uh, has, uh, I mean, okay. So you can already see the event uh, for the 30th of October for the forum where you can get the certificate uh, recognized by Ministry of Education. You can now register at the app. Um, if you look for this event, SDG, what can we do? And click to attend, participate, you'll be able to be uh, notified for the event. The app is also now updated where you can download your e-certificates under your events. So if you go to any of the events and if you qualify for an e-certificate, you will see a link here. And if you click this button, you'll be able to download the certificate. And if you go to the, um, the one that's with the Ministry of Education support, you can go to the, to the um, event and download the links here. We would like to thank our sponsors for today's quiz prizes, Churchill Conservation Society, Dominic O'Sullivan, and Salute for these amazing prizes. Thank you. Um, so here you will see two QR codes. On the left, you can click, um, I mean, sorry, you can use your phone and scan it and join uh, our Facebook uh, page, um, the MNS Negri Similar and Laka branch. And on the right, you'll see the YouTube uh, link to all the recorded talks um, from this event. Please like and subscribe so that you can be um, notified for future events. So this has been the schedule for the talk series. Today is the seventh talk and we will hear from Jolene on um, our second session on life, of, life on Earth. And the topic is Primates of Malaysia. So let me introduce to you who is Jolene Yap. She is the founder and director of Langor Project Penang, LPP, a citizen science-based permit research and conservation project on the ski langurs to educate fellow Malaysians about the importance of coexisting with our wildlife residents. She is also a skilled environmental educator and a certified nature tourist guide in Malaysia. She is also a published author of an educational picture book on dusky langurs, which we will see more of later. She is currently a PhD researcher in zoology at the University Science Malaysia. In 2018, she, award, she was awarded NAAEE Environmental Educator 30 Under 30. She's also a TEDx speaker on 2019. And in 2021, she was featured in BBC Earth twice in Primates Documentary and My Place on Earth interview. So let us welcome Jolene Yap to give her talk. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Yin Yi. Hello, everyone. Hello, fellow nature heroes. So my name is Jolene. All of you can call me Jolene or call me Dusky Tietie. So Tietie means uh, sister in Mandarin, but feel free to call me anything you want or even Auntie Monkey, etc. Because uh, we're going to have fun in this session. So most important, just relax, grab your drink, hot chocolate, or even your sweets around. No one is judging you. So uh, let's get started with today's topic, yeah, which is on primates in Malaysia, but zoom into Dusky Langers. All right, please allow me a few seconds to share my slides. Yen Yi, let me know once you can see my full screen, yeah? All right. Um, still waiting. <laughs> All right, yeah. Oh, yeah. Let me take some while. All right, thank you so much, Yen Yi. All right, Nature Heroes. So today we are talking about primates of Malaysia. Since today we only have 30 minutes, I don't have a lot of time to talk about every single primates in Malaysia. So what I'm going to do is to introduce you all about some primates in Malaysia, and then we are going into the life of a special looking monkey in Malaysia, which is known as the Dusky Langer. Oh, what is Dusky Langer? So can you see this photo over here? very weird looking monkey, right? 
it's like wearing a white spectacle, just like Dusky Jitie over here, wearing this white spectacle, yeah, just like Yan Yi Jitie over there, as well as a very adorable baby over here. So what is this monkey? Hmm. So if you look at their names, right, they have very special name. We call them the Dusky Langer, Dusky Leaf Monkey, or even in Bahasa, Lutong Chengkong or Lutong Bechela. Mandarin, we call it the Yan Jing Shi Ye Hou. Hmm, now I want you guys to think about the origin behind this name. Why do we call them these different unique names? Which later on, Dusky JJ is going to explain more details about the names and the characteristic of this species of monkey later on, yeah? Okay, let's do some ice-breaking session. Alright, so um, we all trap at home every day since the beginning of Forever MCO, FMCO. Alright, so here there's different pictures of the dusky leaf monkey, dusky langers, as you can see over here, nine different pictures. So how do you feel today? Which dusky langer are you today? Ah, please write down the number in the chat, chat box inside and see what are you today. Oh, I see Yen Yi is the first one excited. Linisha is also very excited. How about the others? Wasting your number six sleepy. Hopefully, my talk won't make you sleepy or make you awake. Eh? Ah, but I can see that some of you are hungry, some of you are very excited, and some of you are very focused. Amazing, amazing. Very amazing nature heroes. Yeah. Today, I'm feeling excited as well. And I'm also number seven. I need a friend. Yeah, it has been a while since I actually go out to hang out with my friends in cafe, go for hiking, etc. I'm sure everyone missed that, right? But please remember, please do our part. Kita jaga kita. Soon, we are able to go outdoors and enjoy nature together. But right now, please spend a little bit of your time and listen to my story about primates in Malaysia as well as dusky langers. All right, I'm going to the next slides. So let me talk a little bit about which organization I'm from. Ah, so I'm from this organization known as Langer Project Penang, short form LPP. All right, okay. So LPP is not a NGO. It's not a non-government organization yet. We're actually under the umbrella of a registered NGO in Malaysia, which is known as Malaysian Primatological Society. It's like a society in Malaysia that people that love primates and study primates. Yeah. So what is the term primate? Hmm, don't worry, later I'm going to explain more about it later. Yeah. So we are a group of people that get together and to do our part to protect the monkey species in Malaysia, especially the dusky langers. And I'm sure that you all are familiar with the sustainable development goals, right? So when you look at the different goals, right, the 17 goals, number 15 is actually life on land, which is the topic that we're going to focus today. What is the importance of forests? You guys already heard some of the highlights from the previous talks. And the definition and the objective of the life of land is to protect, restore, and promote sustainable use of ecosystem, especially in managing forests and to reverse land degradation and halt biodiversity loss. So we in Langer Project Penang is looking forward to use what we have, our strength, to be the voice of the wildlife residents around us, starting from dusky langers, starting from birds, starting from lizards, anything which is a living being on the land. All right, everyone remember that? Okay, so for Langer Project Penang, we focus on research project where we go into the forest, like we spend between seven hours to 12 hours per day in the typical field work days where we follow the monkeys on the ground and we record down about their behavior, ecology and road ecology of dusky langers. If you are not familiar with these terms, right, no worries. Later, I'm gonna explain more about it, yeah? Okay. Now, I'm going to pause about the dusky language for a second. I would like to show you guys how amazing it is on the biodiversity of primate species in Malaysia. Do you all know that Malaysia is the home to 26 species of primates? Who knows about it? If you know, you write yes. If you don't know, you write no. No worries, don't be shy. Anyone knows about it? Ah, all right. Most people, when they hear about 26 species, right, they will be thinking like, yeah, it's only 26 species only, man, not a lot. Actually, 
Malaysia with 26 species of primate is considered really, really amazing. Why? Because in Southeast Asia, we are the second country with the highest number of species of primates after Indonesia, which is 59 to 60 species. So what are the 26 species of primates? To be honest, there's no photographer in Malaysia that able to capture all the 26 species yet, but Tada, in the next slides. Ah, this is how the 26 species of primates look like. They all look different, just like us. We look different, right? But we are family. Ah, so as you can see, if you follow my cursor, follow my arrow, everyone, in the primate family, yeah, so in the monkey, apes, Tassil, Loris's family, you can find them in different appearance, different colors, etc. So from the commonly seen long-tailed macaques, like the brown monkey that you can see in the parks, or sometimes people feed them, is this the right thing to do? Which we're going to look into it later. And from dusky langers, or even the relatives of dusky langers, like other leaf monkeys, like banded langers, silver langers, as well as to apes, Ah, like the small apes on the top right, we have the gibbons, the singing ape. And if we go towards the left, to the great ape in Asia, which is the orangutan. I'm sure that everyone knows about orangutan, the great ape in Asia, right? So what are primates? How do we define primates? Yeah, so there are many definitions of primates. So basically, to make it easy to understand, primates are mammals, right? So... Let me ask you all a question. Are we humans primates? Yes or no? Are we primates? So primates actually consist of a different category of mammals, like for example, apes. Like we humans, we are apes as well. Monkeys, all right? And humans, as well as other different types of primates like lorises as well as tassil. Yeah, so primates is rich in biodiversity. You can find them on terrestrial land. You can find them up in the trees. You can find them along the mangrove, along the peat swamp. And now, where can you find them? You can even find them in urban areas like our household, like our neighborhood. So why? Have you thought of why? Why monkeys or apes used to live in the forest and now we can see them around the parks and even around our neighborhood? Why? I want every nature heroes that are listening to think about this why, which we're going to explore more about it later on, yeah? All right, okay. Now, we are going to focus into the dusky langers, all right? Okay, so from now on, I'm going to use these two words to describe this species of monkey, all right? Dusky langer. So what is dusky? Dusky means dark grayish in color, all right? Just, the color, just like the color of my hair, dark grayish in color, but I don't have gray hair now, like I'm still young, ma. Huh? All right, okay. So langer basically means leaf-eating monkey. Leaf monkeys over here. So normally we call them dusky leaf monkey, but for me, I like to call them the dusky langer because dusky langer, langers is already means uh, leaf-eating monkeys as well as monkeys with long tails. All right, yeah. And people call them lutong chengkong or lutong bachela. All right, and dusky langers, they have a very unique call. Yeah, so they are just like us. They are social animals, right? So when they feel there's like a danger around or another group of monkeys coming into their territory and the man of the house, the alpha male, the pack leader, yeah, the group leader, yeah, it will call. So the dusky leaf monkey alpha male calls like this. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Ah, so their calls is also very interesting, but they don't sing, they don't call as much as some other species of primates, but they are very unique and important for our forest ecosystem. Why? Let's see. Okay, so this is a screenshot from the uh, IUCN Red List website. So as you can see over here, dusky langers, they are currently endangered species, all right? And you can find them not only in Malaysia, but also in Thailand, and Myanmar, all right? So they are distributed from the top to the bottom of this long sweet potato. Ah, so you have the Myanmar, Thailand, and the whole West Peninsula, Malaysia, yeah? Which includes the small islands like Pining Island, uh, Pangko Island, and Berhentian Island, yeah? And their population trend is decreasing. 
All right, their main habitat is actually forests. They are terrestrial forests, artificial forests. It's like degraded forests. Why? Yeah, which is also the question I still want you to think about it later, which we're going to explore more in this sharing. Okay, so for Langer Project Penang LPP, we are a group of individuals. As you can see, we all look different. And some as young as 18 years old, and some as uh, young as uh, 62 years old. And we are a group of people that come together, wish to be citizen scientists, wish to be young and senior scientists to do our part in contributing. Sorry about that. Okay, in contributing towards climate conservation. So this demonstrates what we do most of the time in the forest. Yeah, we will look up for several hours per day. Yeah, so one of the side effects that we get from our field work is the neck ache. And we utilize our binoculars to look at the monkeys up in the tree. And we use camera to capture their pictures to observe their ecology and behavior. So basically, we're interested in their activities, like what do they do throughout the day? And what do they eat? What are their food plants? And where do they go? How is their traveling routes? How big is their home range, etc. So these are the questions that we wanted to know, we wanted to explore. And most of the time, we don't really see the monkeys up close. Many people see our pictures, they were like, oh, you can see the monkeys so close. Actually, no. The monkeys, most of the time, is like 10 meters or even above 10 meters away from us. Just like us in this uh, beautiful forest of Bukit Matajam, most of the time, what we do when we are looking through the binoculars is to see slightly movement in the foliage, in the leaves, but we can't really see them very clearly unless we have patience we have time, we have dedication as field researcher to be there and to observe their behavior. And as time goes by, through the binoculars, you're able to observe the physical appearance of a dusky langer. So how do a dusky langer look like? They have a fluffy white hair crown, as you can see on this photo over here. And then when you slowly move down, vertically, you're able to observe their eyes. They have white patches around their eyes, just like eyeglasses I mentioned before, and also creamy patch around their mouth, and their body is dark grey body fur with slightly whitish fur in the middle of their body. And when you look at their hands, all right, their palms, their fingers, they have opposable thumb and fingers just like us. This helps them to move very agilely on the trees and moving from trees to trees, all right? And they have a very, very long tail. Their tail can be longer their whole body from the head to toe, which is really amazing, all right? And some of you may be thinking like, oh, why the baby is orange in color? It looks like Sun Mukong, right? Ah, look like the monkey king. Yeah, so why orange? All right, so basically in Malaysia, yeah, you can find leaf-eating monkeys, langurs, in two main genus. First is Trichipithecus, which is where these dusky langurs belong to. And another one is Pribaitis. All right, yeah. And for the leaf monkeys under Trichipithecus, just like dusky langurs, their babies are all orange, bright yellow in color. But another genus, Pribaitis, their babies are light whitish in color. So this is their characteristic. But the orange baby also serves as a very good reminder for the family members. Because one group of dusky langers, you have like 18 to 20 individuals. And uh, most of the time, you can find one to three individuals of orange baby in the group. So the color is like telling the family members like, ah, I'm the most precious one. I'm the baby. So my senior family members can take good care of me. As you can see in this slide over here, their color don't change overnight. Yeah? Many people always think that dusky langurs, their color change overnight. Actually, the orange fur begins to shed at the beginning of week two, and slowly the black grayish hair will start to appear. And by fourth month of their age, they will slowly look like fluffy black grayish little dusky langur. All right? So now I'm going to share with you some of the characteristics, some of the uh, behavior of the dusky langurs. First, they're arboreal. So do 
other species of primates like gibbons, orangutan, long-tailed macaques, etc. They are all arboreal primates, means they live in trees, they feed in trees, they do everything up in the trees. Without trees, the dusky langurs can't survive, cannot survive. All right, they are social primates. Yeah, still remember I was talking about the orange baby is like a reminder, it's like an indicator to other, other family members to protect them. So they carry out a lot of uh, um, allo mothering activities as well as uh, grooming each other. This is to strengthen their bond. Just like us humans, you have your good friends, you have your close friends, and for them, they express their love and bond and trust to other individuals through the activities of grooming each other, following each other, and sleeping with each other, yeah? So now I'm going to show you a video of how the dusky langurs interact in the trees. Ah, I hope you guys can see this video. If it's slightly lagging, it's fine. Yeah, you can find a lot of these videos in our website, which we will share to you all later. You can see all the black grayish adult individuals or the brother and sister sub-adults individuals. They are surrounding the baby to ensure the safety of the baby. So they are extremely social, just like us humans. They have emotion. They know how to carry out their daily routine as a individual monkey to strengthen the bond among family members all right so we are there like a very distant cousins and we share a lot of similarities second uh third sorry they are fully versed monkey means they are leaf eating experts 62 percent of their diet consists of leaves ah and other 40 percent of their diet consists of fruits and flowers all right and for dusky langurs they feed on a lot of young leaves and they have a special digestive system of a three chamber stomach which help them to break down the cellulose of the leaves so that they can absorb the nutrients that's why they spend a lot of time up in the tree resting to digest and you may be thinking if they feed on leaves will they help to regenerate the forest the answer is yes all right, so there's around 21% of their diet consists of fruits, even though they don't feed on fruits most of the time. But when they feed on leaves, imagine, yeah, everyone, when they feed on leaves, they will help to distribute the ripened fruits and the fruits will fall onto the ground and the ripened fruits will be the food resources for other land-dwelling animals to feed on the fruits, which then the forest animal carry out their daily tasks in dispersing the seeds in regrowing the forest. All right, and these are some of the amazing fruits that you can find in the forest, in our native forest, from Santoy, the one that I'm circling right now, to Jering, Therap Nasi, the one that looks like a mini uh, jackfruit, as well as ficus. Yeah, so dusky langurs, they are just like birds, insects, tapir, elephants, all different animals in the forest form together as a working collaborative effort to regenerate the forest. All right, and here are some of the plants around your household that can be consumed by dusky langurs. So if you pay attention in your local park or even street tree, you may find angsana tree, which having like those dumpling looking uh, fruits. Yeah, as well as hibiscus, ketapang, isora. These are some of the uh, food plant of the dusky langurs that they can consume. As well as the uh, introduced species, rain tree. Yeah, you have jerring. Yeah, this one is like the wild patai that we can find in the forest. All right, so these are some of the example of the fruits, uh, the food plant of the dusky langurs that you may find familiar and you may have seen them before around your neighborhood, yeah? Okay, so if there's one thing that I learned from observing dusky langurs in the wild for six years is to learn about coexistence. What is coexistence? means people or even animals of different species or different appearance able to coexist, live together in the same patch of forest or same habitat, all right? So as you can see in this photo over here, the dusky langur on the left and the long tail macaque on the right, they are grooming each other. Even though they are different species, but they share the same tree, they share the same food, they share the same sleeping trees. So they coexist well without conflict. 
So this is something that we have to learn from our wildlife residents. If they can coexist well, why can't we? Look at this video. All right, pay attention to the detail. On the bottom left, you have the brown long tail macaques. All right, the mother is grooming the baby. And on the right, you have the dusky langer mother grooming the dusky langer baby. So two pairs of mother and children, they are just hanging around with each other on the same single tree. So this is really inspiring, especially to me, because every time when I see sightings like this, behavior like this, I feel so touched in the fact that animals able to tolerate, understand each other needs, while we humans have so much to learn from them. All right, so why do animals coexist? I emphasize quite several times just now. Yeah, so animals, they know how to tolerate each other, understand each other, and they are all peaceful creatures as they share the same habitat. So each wildlife resident play a role in maintaining a balanced ecosystem in the forest habitat. So nature heroes, please remember this, always be the voice of the wildlife residents around you. All right, so what are the other animals that we can find in the forest except just dusky langers? So from long tail macaques, which is very common, we see them uh, interact with each other a lot, a, lot, a lot of times, as well as the squirrels, you find uh, monkeys and squirrels on the same tree most of the time. And sometimes you see some very cryptic and very mysterious species like Sunda Kolugo, bracket tail drongo, and you have even like a chance to see snakes when you're working in the forest. However, we follow a standard protocol, SOP, in ensuring our safety, as well as we have a methodology of conducting research. If you're interested, can always contact us, which we're going to talk more about it with you guys later on. All right, okay. So just now I was talking about primates in Malaysia, as well as some uh, facts about our ski langers. Now let's look at the reality. Look around you. All right, there are houses, infrastructure, and human-made structures everywhere. So if you look at this graphic, right, I would like everyone to follow my cursor, all right, towards the left. Try to imagine, long, long time ago, all the monkeys, animals, they're living very happily in the forest. But then, when humans started to intrude the forest and start the tree clearing, etc., it doesn't cause only habitat loss, but also habitat fragmentation. And when humans have more accessibility into the forest, and some very bad human beings will do very bad things such as poaching, catching the animal out from the forest, or other, other negative reason. And when the forest is being clear for our houses, for our infrastructure, for our shopping malls, and you will have roads around, because roads makes it very convenient for human beings to go from point A to point B. But it causes unnecessary accidents as well as inconvenience situation for the animals, not only monkeys, but also elephants, tapir, leopards, tigers, etc. All right? And this causes road kills. So urbanization is a problem to the animals that are living around us, not only in the forest. And when we talk about social media, now everyone is obsessed with TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, right? And this also creates opportunity for people to interact with each other for illegal wildlife pet trade. So nature heroes, try to think about the whole storyline regarding why animals are appearing around us, our neighborhood. It's due to the fact that humans are not respecting the life on land. Our fate as a species depends on the state of our most important habitat, which is land. All right, now I'm going to highlight the three main threats towards dusky langers, but not only particularly to dusky langers, but also other species of primates in Malaysia, generally every species of uh, animals in Malaysia and around the earth. First, habitat fragmentation. Everyone imagine, long time ago, there's no roads, so there's trees connect to each other. So monkeys and other wildlife, they're able to move from tree to trees without any obstacles. Habitat fragmentation means when a connected habitat being divided into smaller patches, just like this cartoon over here. When a habitat is being divided into smaller patches, the individuals of the animals from the same group would have to be divided, and this would threaten them in terms of their population, their breeding abilities, as well as their gene pool, which is their genetics as well. All right. 
So as you can see in this photo over here, there's a mother dusky langer and a baby dusky langers. They are also struggle to cross the road. You can imagine when you're crossing the road, you'll be looking to the left, to the right, and to the left, right? And for dusky langers and other species of uh, urban monkeys, they are doing that as well. Because if they're not careful enough, they would encounter road accidents. If there's tree connectivity, they will find opportunity to leap from tree to tree. If there's no tree connectivity around the fragmented habitat, they would have to rely on human-made structure, such as cable wire, as well as your housing rooftop, or even the MRT or LRE structure, etc. All the infrastructure that are made by humans to cross from one patch of the habitat to another patch of the habitat. And this is very risky because it may happen conflict or even negative interaction with humans, which we're going to talk more later on. And most importantly, road accidents. Road accidents happen when you see situations like this in this photo. Try to replace the monkey in the photo with elephants with tapil, with therapins, or even with bats, squirrels. So animals are running across the road every single day. And if vehicle driver is not careful enough, road accidents will happen, not only harming the animals, but also drivers as well. So habitat fragmentation is a global problem that faced by species of animals as well as humans. All right, now this leads to our second track, which is on the showing the appearance of urban animals. So when we have habitats being divided into smaller patches, and around the small patches, you have a flats, condominiums, housing area, and this will cause the animals to starting to explore their neighborhood, their human's neighborhood. So what would humans do? Some people have very good heart. They will feel like, I need to feed these animals because they look so pity. Yeah, so they started to feed the monkey, feed the wild boar, feed the birds, etc. But is this a right thing to do, everyone? Is this a right thing to do? Now I'm taking human monkey interaction as example. Yeah. So feeding monkey is a is a negative behavior. It's not a behavior that we encourage because it will cause negative human monkey interaction. Why? First of all, we have to ask ourselves, why do people feed monkeys? There are many reasons. First, religion problem. And second, ecotourism problem, or even tourism sites problem. And third, out of sympathy or the feeling of not want to waste food. So it's all about attitude, human attitude, feeling like they need to help the animals, but they're helping it through the wrong way. So why can't we feed monkeys? All right. First, human food is not suitable for wild monkeys. Our food is high in sugar, salt, preservative. It's just not suitable for monkeys. And human foods can cause obesity, all right, for the monkeys due to long-term feeding. So if you see photos of like very obese monkeys just stay by the road or even being hurt by humans, please don't laugh at them, especially now their social media platform, especially on TikTok, there are many young people are feeding animals, wild animals. And this is really sad because they don't see the negative consequences out of feeding monkeys or even other wild animals. And second, monkeys will lose their foraging instinct. Okay, everyone imagine the life of a monkey, the life of a long tail macaques and dusky langers. When sun rises, they wake up from their sleeping tree, they start moving, feeding on the tree, move again, feeding on the tree, sleep, play, move and until sunset they're back to their tree and sleep so they are continuously moving so when we start to feed the monkeys the monkeys will become lazy and they will start relying on humans for food and this leads to negative human monkey interaction or you call it the word conflict the monkey will start to do trading butter trading you give me your your food and i return you your hat this happened in many tourism sites, such as in Malaysia, we have the Batu Cave, very, very good example. Humans and the monkeys are having some aggression conflict. And next, we come to rubbish pollution. I'm sure that everyone has to admit that the waste management in Malaysia around our neighborhood is not that good. So this creates a problem not only for monkeys, but also our domestic animals, such as stray dogs, stray cats, even rats. So the 
very poor waste management around our neighborhood attracts rats or even waste or even stray animals as well as urban monkeys as well. And this causes the rubbish to be dragged by the animals to various parts of our neighborhood. So it causes a lot of inconvenience such as uh, rubbish pollution as well as uh, the whole area of our neighborhood just not looking as pleasant as we thought. All right. And when the monkeys become lazy, when they are relying humans for food and they will have nothing to do. So when they have nothing to do and they will start to breed, all right, they will start to interact with each other more, including increase in the activity of population, grooming, etc. So this will cause the overpopulation of monkeys in urban area, which expose them to road sites, expose them to electrocution by moving along more frequently on the cable wire. So it doesn't serve any good to the animals and humans as well. All right, and this point is very important, which is on the risk of disease transmission. Many people taking videos of themselves hugging monkeys, feeding monkeys on Instagram and TikTok. Is this a good thing to do? It's not a good thing, right? I'm sure that everyone agree. Because one more thing that we must always keep in mind is by having very close contact with wild animals, this will enhance the risk in disease transmission. Let me do a very simple example. If I'm having flu and I sneeze, achoo, and there's germs around me, right? And if I hand a peanut to a monkey, the germs will go to the food and to the monkey. And for the baby monkey that took my peanut, the baby monkey may caught my flu. And for the monkey, he may fall sick. And for me, I may able to catch some, like even a, like a parasites or even a diseases from the monkey as well. So never have close contact with wild animals. All right? All right. Okay. The last point of all, why we shouldn't feed monkeys is on illegal wildlife pet trade, all right? When we feed monkeys and they get used to human, and this will create opportunity for some bad humans to use this advantage to catch baby monkeys, to sell to people as exotic pets. Trust me, this happens in reality, okay? Now look at the babies. Their babies are so adorable. They're orange in color. And many people like to keep them as pets. If you look on Facebook, Instagram, you can find many people are keeping uh, Dusky Langer's baby as pets, including celebrities that encourage their followers to do such thing to our poor, poor primate species. So if you use your uh, Facebook, Instagram, you search the keywords, Dusky Leaf Monkey for Sale, Monkey de Drow, Monia de Drow, you'll find all these different posts. But this don't apply just for Dusky Langers, but also for orang utans, long tail macaques, big tail macaques, sun bears, birds, reptiles, every single species that you can think of. Or you can even walk into the exotic pet shop and you can see what's there instead of domestic pet. Primates are not pets. Why? First, freedom. Animals should have the right to be free. Like I mentioned so many times just now, their habitat is the land, the forest. So if we encourage illegal wildlife pet trade, which is having monkey as pets, they will get chained or even live in our house with no proper environment. And this will cause many, many problems in terms of their behavior, health, and other issues. Nursing. Babies are meant to be with their mama. They need their mom's breast milk, not milk formula, like a red, red recipe that being sold in shop, etc. All right. And zoonosis, like I mentioned in the uh, no feeding monkey just now, humans make monkey ill, monkey makes human ill. So the best way is to appreciate them from a distance. Do not touch them. Do not interact with them in any form. Even in our research, we never touch monkeys at all. We always observe them through a minimum distance of five to eight meters. All right. Damages. All right. Monkeys can cause serious injuries and property damages. Not only through feeding monkeys, the monkeys will attack you. But if someone have a monkey as pet and all of a sudden the monkey uh, ran out from home, the monkey will be overwhelmed by the surrounding. All right. And the monkey may start to yeah, feel confused and attack humans as well or even uh, ruin a property. So this can happen. So eventually monkeys do not make good pets because they live a very, very 
short term of life is being under the care of humans. Humans don't know how to take care of them, give them the wrong food, etc. So for orange baby or dusky langers, normally they do not live more than six months due to lack of nutrients and lack of freedom. Also, if you support monkey as pets, you're actually supporting all the scam, all the crimes that are happening on social media because the IQ photos are being used on social media to conduct frauds, all right? Yeah, so online scams are very common and you may be the next victim. And people that are sharing monkeys or wildlife photos to sell on social media, they're attracting your attention. If you like, you share, you are promoting primates as pets, which is you're affecting and threatening the population of Malaysian primate species. Okay, so how do we coexist with monkeys? You may be wondering. Right, so in Langer Project Pinning LPP, we conduct field work and we collect the data on their activity and their behaviors and we share it to the public, just like how Dusky Tete is sharing with you all the natural heroes right now. And we also build canopy bridges for the monkeys to cross road safely. Remember habitat fragmentation? So one of the conservation tools. where we collaborate with our various stakeholders, including authorities, NGOs, and social enterprises. And on the bridge to charge the camera. So this thing over here that I'm circling right now is actually the camera trap. So camera traps help to capture the movement of animals that cross the bridge so that we can uh, evaluate the efficiency of the bridge. And these are some of the photos that we took from the camera trap. The dusky langers, they are actively crossing the bridge that we built, as well as the long tail macaques and plantain squirrel. All right. So the canopy bridge idea is definitely a conservation tool that helps animals to cross roads safely. But I would like everyone to remember that it's not a solution. The solution is for us to respect the land. We shouldn't use this conservation tool to develop more lands, all right? And this canopy bridge is just a tool to help animals to cross and for us to learn about the importance of habitat. All right, outreach and education program. So for Langer Project Penang, we engage with the public through rainforest program, talks and events. And since the pandemic started, we're engaging with you all through Zooms and Google Meet. And we believe in the power of environmental education. Environmental ed education is a process that allows individuals, you, me, everyone, to explore the environment around us, engage in problem solving through citizen science engagement, and think about how and what we can do to improve the environment. So we have been conducting all the different events, including a rainforest shows, road shows, creative contents for social media and activity since 2016. We bring kids, students, adults like you guys into the forest, your nearby forest, not only in Penang, but also different sites in Peninsula Malaysia. And we unlock the potential and we unlock your five senses, all right, to explore the surrounding of the forest through the perspective of dusky langers, to understand the dusky langers' home, their food plants, their friends, and to understand the threats and what we can do as individuals to help the animals. Okay, so if you have a phone, you can scan this QR code or Kai Xian Ge Ge will paste the link in the chat box. If you're seeing dusky langers around your neighborhood, please do not just ignore. You can take photos and you can record down some of the details like the time and date, and you can fill up the questions in this questionnaire. If you feel like it's too troublesome to fill out the questionnaire, you can always contact us through social media, Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp, and send us more details regarding the sighting of the dusky langers around you, because all this information is crucially important to us so that we can use all the different location information and take into consideration for 
future Canopy Bridge project, as well as environmental education activities to educate the public. All right, and some other things that you can do is to tell your parents, tell your family in Drive Slow for Wildlife when you're exploring the coastal forest, when you're exploring the north-south highway through the critical uh, biological hotspots, please always advise the adults around you to drive safely because you never know what creatures would be running across the road. It can be this small, it can be this big. So from rodents to monkeys, every life matters. And another thing that all of you can do is to raise awareness regarding the issue of monkey poisoning. All right, I'm sure that you all know someone that used poison, used rat poison to poison rat, right? There are many people like to do that. So it's very important for us to raise this awareness. When we poison rat and when there's secondary individual like the predator unknowingly feed on the poison prey, just like a stray cat feeding on the poison rat, then the cat would get poisoned and it would pass away as well. So it's very important for us to be more kind and uh, more empathetic so that we can understand it's very important to learn about coexist instead of poisoning animal. Because in Penang, a few months ago, there was a very cruel and sad incident where an individual poisoned nine monkeys. And the nine monkeys was dead in a very horrible way. And it's just due to the fact that the humans don't like them. So the humans poison them. But they have no idea that the poison rat residue, yeah, the leftovers may be around the environment, which is very harmful for human children and even uh, strays animals as well. If you see some wildlife crime activities on internet, like in Instagram and Facebook, where people are keeping monkeys and any wild animals as pets, please do not ignore screenshot and send it to my cat wildlife Heim hotline. They have a WhatsApp number over here. You can take picture and screenshot, send them the details so that they can gather all these details in the statistic where they work alongside the authority, Pahilitan, the wildlife department in carry out the next step. Okay, everyone, please respect nature, keep a safe distance from wild animals and do not feed them, and always advocate for better waste management. All right, if you'd like to understand more regarding our project, you can always scan this QR code, which leads you to one of our page in our website, where we are launching a children's book. So in this book, there's um, many beautiful illustrations by a local artist, Teacher Amy, where she illustrated the journey of Langer Project Penang in advocating for safe crossing as well as environmental education. Okay, and you can also do your part in supporting uh, various NGOs and wildlife communities around you by um, not only just volunteering or even uh, share their posts, and you can also purchase their in-house merchandise. Like in our case, we have this very cute looking dusky dolls is hopefully to advocate for primates are not pets. If you want a monkey as pets, you buy a dog which lasts forever, but a living monkey may just able to live for six months under the human's poor care. All right, so the message from this sharing is, I want all the nature heroes out there to think about, can we coexist with our wildlife residents? All right, we are lucky to be living in Malaysia. We are lucky to be able to share the land, water, and sky with our diverse wildlife residents. And we humans can also be a threat to their survival. So let us all acknowledge our wildlife residents with respect and understanding. All right, so if you'd like to see more graphics, videos, and information of Langer Project Penang, especially on Dusky Leaf Monkey, Dusky Langers, please follow us on social media on the top left. All right, and you also feel free to visit our website as well as email us any questions you have. Okay, all right, that's all for my presentation. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jorin. That was very inspiring. You went from um, introducing all the primates of Malaysia to um, illegal wildlife trade, and it was all very important message for our young ones. And I hope um, everyone has been listening well and will learn from Dusty to get. <laughs> So now I will show you um, the app which you have uh, been using for a long time. So I'll just remind you again. So if you go on the events tab and scroll down to go to our event today. Um, 
just click it. Okay. Um, it, there's the quiz button already turned up, so you can, you can already start answering the quiz question. And also, um, there is the follow-up action for today, which is spot a primate. So you can take a photo, um, or you can remember uh, where you've seen primate before near your house or wherever you've seen them, and describe the area or the roadside near the forest, for example, and um, put the location of your uh, sighting and the type of primate that you've seen um, to earn 50 eco points. So that's how you do that. Um, and I'm sure this will also help uh, Jolene's project on the citizen science. Yeah, okay. So yeah, so I will, I will pass now to uh, Linisha to um, ask the questions from the chat. All right, thank you so much, Andy. Okay, a very good afternoon to Jolene and everyone who's present for today's talk. Um, as you can see today in another episode of the Nature Hero Talk, we have uh, Jolene sharing her insights on the primates of Malaysia. And uh, a special shout out to Kai for answering the questions in the uh, chat box. Thank you very much. And also sending us the links. It's very useful. So go check it out, uh, everyone. So without further ado, let me start with the Q&A section. So I have a few questions uh, for you, Jolene. Okay, so uh, before this, uh, before that, uh, let's answer this question from Mr. Harris. So the first question is, what is the general temperament of langurs? Are they aggressive like the long-tailed macro, or are they shy primates? All right, so dusky langurs, they are not that aggressive as long-tailed macaques. I, I won't use aggressive, this word, to describe the long-tailed macaque, because if you have the chance to observe wild long-tailed macaques without any, like, uh, um, any feeding activities by humans or even any close contact by humans, the wild long-tailed macaques can be very, very shy and can be very avoidant in terms of humans as well. So for if you want to compare both behaviors, yes, for the uh, dusky langurs, they are more docile, they are more shy, and they are more quiet compared to the long-tailed macaques, where long-tailed macaques tends to vocalize more because they have larger groups, right? Their group is like uh, 30 to 50 individuals sometimes. And uh, within the big group, they have like small like uh, subgroups. And for dusky langurs, they are like uh, one whole troop of uh, maybe 18 to 20 individuals ma maximum. And uh, they just uh, stay together as a whole troop, while the macaques, they have more like, a, yeah, in the group, like a different social behaviors going on. So, but I wouldn't use the word aggressive. Uh, un unless people fit them, then they would behave more aggressively. Yeah, hope this answers the question. Thank you very much for the explanation. Um, a question from me. How did you get the passion to study about uh, languages? Um, it, it, it happens just like uh, unplanned, to be honest. After I finished my undergraduate study, I came back to Malaysia. And then uh, my first career is actually in duck cave conservation site. I'm sure you guys heard about the uh, duck cave conservation site. Unfortunately, it's uh, closed at the moment. So um, since I started my uh, conservation journey in uh, duck cave conservation site, it kind of developed my passion towards uh, being a researcher as well as an environmental educator because I was playing uh, both uh, educational officer as well as scientific officer roles at the same time in the cave. And then I came back to Penang due to family issues and I started to work in tropical spice garden as a nature educationist then I realized that oh all right around the Lobahang there are dusky langurs right and then uh, after when you're working for a while I think some of you can relate when you're working for a while I was working for like four and a half years then I realized that my life is very segment like very still there's nothing challenging anymore I've been doing everything the same thing ordered by the boss every single day. Then I realized that I want to do something different, create something for the communities. Yeah, because uh, I'm a Bukit Matajam girl, yeah, which is my home hometown. I want to do something for my hometown. This is uh, how I uh, knew about my uh, current PhD supervisor, Dr. Nadine Rupert. She's an amazing lady. And then she spoke with me regarding uh, different opportunities in private study. At the time, she was still very young fresh grad from a PhD. Yeah, and then uh, they realized that, oh, maybe I can try. So after researching about some of the species of uh, wildlife primates you can find in Penang, they realized that, oh, dusky langurs, they are quite un understudy as well. Maybe I can pick it up. So this is how it started, unplanned. Yeah. Wow, that is very mm. inspirational. Actually, sometimes when we don't plan things, it's actually like 
it turns out very well for us like sometimes unplanned but it turns out very well so but I'm so definitely, happy for you yeah but I really admire people who have like a childhood like a in inspiration childhood dreams like I really want to do this and they really uh, you know stuck with okay. it until their adulthood yeah those are also very inspiring mm. all right thank you so much uh Jolene. So uh, we have another question from um, Staris. So uh, are dusky langurs a protected species under the Wildlife Protection yes, Act? Yes, according to the Wildlife Conservation Act, so dusky langur is fall under Schedule 1, which is the protected wildlife, but not Schedule 2, uh, not the total protected wildlife species, uh, but also Schedule 6 as well, which is uh, consumable by Oran All right. Uh, another question from JT Lu. Does dusky langurs show friendly action towards the researchers while in the forest? Yeah, so in the beginning of our study, when we need to habituate the dusky langur, means we want them to get used to us without afraid of us. Like during the first week or even the first month or even first three months of the study, when they see us, they will leave away because they are afraid of us, right? So we need to continuously follow them in the forest, let them to get used to our hairstyle and the same color t-shirt. Same, uh, same bag, Yen Yi can relate very, very well. Yeah, so this is how they get used to us and slowly they won't avoid us that much, but they will carry out their daily activities. But they do not show any friendly action. We do not have any in interaction. So basically it's like uh, staying around the same area, like your, your neighbors, right? When they see you, they're like not seeing you. Yeah, some, something like that. <laughs> yeah. Basically they mind their own business. Yes, definitely. <laughs> no interaction. Yeah, no interaction at all. Hmm. All right. Okay. Um, another question. Um, how many species have you uh, encountered so far for dus On, dusky langurs? Uh, dusky date? langur is one species. Yeah, but the, there's a uh, quite a number of subspecies of dusky langurs around the distributed zone, which is the Myanmar, Thailand, and uh, Peninsula Malaysia. Yeah. So if you're Asking about individuals or asking about subspecies, but dusky langur is one single species. Yeah. Because you mentioned there were 26 species, right? Oh, so you mean I was primates. Wondering... Primates. Oh, okay. Ah, okay. uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, I have to count. Yeah. <laughs> I have to count. I need time to count. Let me count it first and then I'll let, let you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. There's another question from your Moi. What is the most uh, surprising or unexpected thing about the dusky language that you encountered thus far? All right. The most surprising thing. Yeah. This is also okay. Uh, I was just talking about this to my team members just now because uh, this morning we received a update from our project assistant, one of the project assistant that uh, someone took photo of a uh, dead juvenile dusky langurs in Penang Botanical Garden. He, and then lo looking at the injury may be due to a fight. And since uh, like for columbines, right, for leaf monkeys in general, infanticide is a common behavior. It's not unusual. It's a common behavior that we can find among leaf monkeys. So one of the most surprising thing that I have encountered like visually so far is from one of our study group, the alpha male, the leader of the group actually had a uh, aggression behavior towards uh, one of his uh, offspring, which is a sub-adult male. So they were chasing one another, they were fighting and then eventually the sub-adult male leaped out from the forest, from the forest edge and then fall onto the road. Yeah. So then uh, that, that time I was realized that, okay, so they are just like what I read in the primate book, it's like once the sub-adult reach a certain maturity, they would have to learn to explore the surrounding and leave the existing group so that they can join other group to enhance their gene pool. So that was one of the most surprising sighting that I, I witnessed with my own eye, which is also quite cruel, but that's the circle of life. Yeah. All right. So uh, another question from Mr. Harris. What would you suggest if we do if langurs enters our house, yard, premises, and etc. All right. First thing is do not panic. There are many people they 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 wasn't aware about monkeys around their neighborhood until there's certain development going on nearby. Then they realize that oh the babi hutan started to come or even the mukek started to come already or the dusky langurs started to come. First thing is do not panic. All right. Don't panic. Then don't go scream or shout whatever thing. Eh? If you scream and shout. If it's a pig tail macaque, if it's a long tail macaque, they may get agitated, they may come towards you. And for dusky langurs, like those shy type, they may leap out to the road, then 
if they encounter a road accident, then it's not a good thing to witness. So do not panic. And second is close your doors and your windows because you don't want the smell in your house, the food scrap smell to attract the animals into your house because they are social primates. They like to explore. So if they are getting lured by certain smell, they will want to explore. It's very normal. All right. So close the windows and doors. And then what you can do at the same time is, is to try to observe the the frequency of them coming into the neighborhood, like uh, how many times they come in to the same zone per week, like uh, how frequent, how many times per day, and start to record down the date and time, and then so that you're able to see the trend of the occurrence, and you know when to close the door and shut the window. And you can do some noises to scare them away, like for example, use the broom to hit the wall, some noises, but not that loud, not until the fact that it would scare them due to high pitch sound, so that they would know that, okay, yeah, this is not their territory, they would have to leave. But of course, there are many other things that you can encourage a neighborhood to do, is not to feed them. Because many people see animals come to their place, they want to feed them. Mm -hmm. This is a very common behavior by human beings. So please raise awareness on don't feed and better waste management. When you keep your ru rubbish bin outside, please close it up. Do not open it up to attract the monkeys, attract the stray animals, and eventually they were just having a feast in front of the house. So there are many things that you can do. Please check out on our website, which Kaisian already shared the Instagram link, and that link should provide sufficient information regarding what to do when you see dusky langers or other wild primates around the neighborhood. Thanks. All right. Thank you so much for the tips and explanation, Rogan. So uh, we, move on, we move on to the next question. Um, could you describe the difficulty level of spotting langurs and uh, in which season are they found frequently throughout the year? All right, uh, so the first question is on would I describe the difficulty in observing dusky langur? Am I right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, let me answer this first. So dusky langur, it depends on the habitat as well. Like if you go to a park, a recreational park, where the dusky langur groups over there are so used to human joggers, or even hikers, then they are already habituated to human noises, steps, stands, etc. Yeah, so for those kind of environment, it's easier to spot them. But to follow them is another case, because like, you need to follow them for several hours per day, then it's another challenge. So if you go to a more protected area, like a more uh, like a, a thicker canopy emergent area, yeah, so it's much more difficult to spot them. So it depends on the area that you're looking at. It depends on the environment. All right. Linisha, would you repeat the sec second question again? Uh, and in which season are they found frequently throughout the year? Um, basically, they are, you can find them throughout the year. That's, they are not like a seasonal breeder or what. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it depends on the habitat as well. Like, for example, a hill as an example, like in my hometown, just what I'm looking right now is a hill, it's a Bukit Matajam hill. Mm -hmm. Around the Bukit Matajam hill is like a neighborhood area, etc. So it's like covered by a human civilization. So in that hill, you may find some similarity in terms of breeding because the groups over there, they are here and there, right? Yeah, so eventually they just yeah. move around that area as well. Of course, you can see a similarity in the occurrence of orange babies and juveniles. But if you talk about are they seasonal breed breeder, they are not really. So they breed throughout the year. Yeah, so it depends on the maturity of the females, the number of females, the number of males, etc. All the social competition. Yeah, social composition. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for the great insight. Uh, another question from the uh, chat box. Uh, there are many cases of primates entering food plantations and having a feast. What would you recommend uh, to best manage this scenario? All right, this is a very inter interesting question. Also, many people have their many different ways. I would say, how would the normal people treat this kind of problem is they would use very cruel solution, such as poisoning the monkeys or even shoot the monkey to death. Yeah, this is what the typical, like, people who are, not aware of the importance of a primates or animals in general. Not only happens to monkey, but also different terrestrial animals as well, right? Yeah, so like for me, I have a farm. I have a small farm in Jawi. My farm is close to the four forest. So every day, there's silver langer, dusky langer, and um, long, long tail maggot come to my farm. And my mom and my family, they already got used to it already. Yeah, because there's one thing that we do is we keep dogs. I would say that dogs are very useful. A pack of dogs and you fence up your farm, and then you wrap the fruit well, 
you wrap the fruit well by using creative methods. Some people use plastic, okay, but plastic easy to being rip, rip off. And there's one creative method that I see one far farmers always use is use the mengguang leaf to wrap the fruit. More work to be done, but mengguang leaf is very, very uh, durable and very tough and not that uh, easy accessible by the monkeys and squirrels. So always harvest your fruit on time, wrap your fruits well. And also, if you're able to think of some mitigation planning, like keep dogs, or even you have your, your special, like a fake tiger decoration in the farm, then it works as well. But if you're referring to like an oil farm plant, plantation, etc., then it's more tricky because it's like a very huge plantation, right? So I would think that if you look into land conservation planning, like buffer zone arrangement, etc., then it will be more long term in terms of effectiveness. Yeah. Uh, just, uh, I'm just interested to know, are there any specific food that you're not allowed to eat? Uh, there are many, food? many types of food they are not allowed to eat. Um, human foods and even extremely sweet fruits. I'm sorry, uh, my, my dogs are playing in the background. <laughs> durian, what about durian? Can they eat durian? So far, I have not encountered dusky langers rip off durians before. Only long tail mechanics. All right. So uh, before we end the session, I have one more question to ask. Um, is there any possible way that, um, oh, sorry, um, are dusky langurs uh, endangered on any initiative to protect them? Yes, dusky langurs, they are endangered species under IOC and red list globally. Yeah? But if you look into the different subspecies, some subspecies are still categorized as a vulnerable as a near threatened, etc. But globally, skill in IUCN, they are, they are uh, an endangered species. Um, if you talk about the actions that are to be ta taken, it's a very complicated issue to talk about. But uh, I would say that the authorities are trying their best, as well as N NGOs leaders or even citizen science platform like us, we are trying our best to work together among different stakeholders. Because I would agree that everyone in Malaysian conservation scene would agree that Malaysian conservation scene is extremely difficult compared to our other neighboring countries. Because we need a lot of communication, trust, as well as the manpower and funding. And most important is the attitude to acknowledge the roots of the problem and work together to solve it. And for me, as a citizen science group leader and as an NGO board member, I do my best. I continue to lead my team of young people and uh, citizen scientists to do what we can. Like we came out with the canopy bridge and we will continue working on that and continue to working on environmental education, etc. Hopefully it will inspire more youth like the nature heroes watching right now to take up what they can, their strength through arts and craft storytelling, use your voice to advocate for coexistence. Because what we can really do now from this sharing immediately after you're done with your your routine every day is to learn how to coexist with the wildlife residents around us. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Jolene, for the very insightful information. Um, I hope everyone of you um, learned from what Jolene has explained just now. And now I would uh, pass this session to Yang Yi. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anisha. And thank you, Jolene, for answering all the questions. And thank you all for your questions. Um, they were very good and important questions. So now I would like to uh, announce the winners of the quiz for today. And I shall share my screen again. All right, since we are a bit um, late already today, I will just go straight to the results. Um, today we had 144 participants and I shall right now click the quiz results link. So here you go. Um, Wilbur is the only 100%. And we have Nor Laila, YJ Tan, Angelo, and Suhaila. Congratulations to all of you. And uh, you can go back to the app here on the side. You can click the three lines and click on info and scroll down to find Ruti's email or phone number where you can uh, send him a message on your name and address. So thank you very much. Um, one last thing that I would like to show is the, hang on there. Okay, so we have this event going on and we are trying to uh, support uh, replanting in Malaysia. So. 
So we now have 10 acres from MNS HQ at our very own Kuala Selangor Nature Park, KNSP, and we are launching this initiative to plant mangroves and at the same time help KNSP to survive this very, very challenging time. So this initiative is called We Plant For You Initiative, and one acre, uh, we can plant 4,000 trees, and uh, one tree, uh, one acre, sorry, one tree is 25 ringgit or 40 ringgit, depending on if you're a student or an adult. And if you, if you get 100 trees, uh, we can sign a board that will be elected, uh, erected in um, the organization, family um, or family. Um, and then you can bank in your um, uh, donation to, to this uh, account number. So um, I hope that we can raise at least 100 trees for the Greece and Milan or Latka. So I do encourage to share with your friends and family or any organizations you know. Um, if you'd like to know more information, um, please uh, contact us and contact Kitty or me uh, through the app. So yeah, um, I'll just go back to share. Sorry, it's just um, a lot of screens. <laughs> okay, so um, this is our last slide. Um, so thank you very much, Jolene, for your time today to um, give this talk and to also answer all the questions. And thank you to technical uh, support, Mr. Harris, co-host, Lanisha, and Chris Master Zoe. And big thanks to you, our audience, for listening in today. So that's all for today, so thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. If you have any further questions, please don't hesitate to contact us through social media. We are here to answer all your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Yen Yi. Thank you, Linisha. Thank, thank, so thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Okay, thank you. Thank you, bye. Thank you, host. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, teacher. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>